Good morning, and welcome to the first part of an exciting discussion on the science, safety, and distribution of COVID-19 vaccines. I'm Laura Chang, one of the anesthesiologists and intensivists within the Department of Anesthesiology and Perioperative Medicine. I'd like to begin today's session by thanking not only those within the Dartmouth-Hitchcock Health System, but also those in the surrounding community, individuals who have dedicated their time and talent despite significant increased risk to themselves. Specifically, I'd like to acknowledge primary care physicians, emergency response personnel, teachers, and essential workers. Your dedication and commitment is acknowledged and much appreciated. The impetus for today's conference was not to create a pro-vaccine session. Rather, the goal was to create a pro-information forum, one where members of our community, including you and I, could hear and learn from infectious disease and virology experts. I think we can all agree that in today's world, the amount of misinformation, speculation, and conjecture on the internet is huge. And so the ability to share information based and rooted in science is absolutely essential. As such, today I have the distinct pleasure of introducing to you Dr. Katherine Stevenson. Dr. Stevenson is a physician scientist at Harvard Medical School and Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, Massachusetts. Dr. Stevenson is a practicing physician who specializes in infectious diseases, as well as a researcher who focuses on developing novel biomedical interventions to prevent and treat HIV and other emerging infectious diseases, including Zika virus and COVID-19. She is the director of the Clinical Trials Unit at the Harvard Center for Virology and Vaccine Research, and has led a number of clinical trials looking at broadly neutralizing antibodies for the treatment and prevention of HIV-1 as well as current studies of monoclonal antibodies and vaccines to prevent COVID-19. She is also an outspoken advocate for increasing research equity for Black and Hispanic communities in clinical trials and beyond, and is committed to ensuring access to promising medications and vaccines for our most vulnerable communities. I would also like to introduce to you and welcome Dr. Elizabeth Talbot and Dr. Michael Calderuth, both infectious disease physicians within the DHH system Dr. Talbot is the New Hampshire State Deputy Epidemiologist. Dr. Calderwood is the Associate Chief Quality Officer. Both will lead our presentation on Monday, and at that time I'll speak more to the focus of their clinical careers. But today, they will join me in moderating any questions that arise pertaining to logistical and population-based health issues. Today, we'll begin our session with a didactics portion from Dr. Stevenson, and then continue on to a question and answer period. While I have a list of numerous questions gathered from the past week or so from our staff and other personnel, I encourage you to use the question and answer board to send us your queries real time. Time permitting, we'll try to get to all of them. And so, without further ado, I will turn the presentation over to Dr. Stevenson. Dr. Stevenson, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I am so excited to join you guys today. And um, it's wonderful to see Dr. Calderwood on this speaker series um, since we actually trained together um, down in Boston a number of years, years ago in infectious diseases. So it's great to see you again. Um, so I agree with this format. I think it's important to keep in mind that um, we're not, nobody ever is ever trying to push a vaccine. Um, on anyone else. I think it's more just making sure everybody can make an informed decision themselves about whether a vaccine is a good idea for you. So I, um, I'm a clinical investigator, so I do trials and those trials are funded by the NIH and then also by um, some different industry partners, but I personally don't have any conflict of interest. And I actually kind of want to emphasize that because I do work a lot on, in particular, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine but I don't work for them. I don't have any stock in J&J. &J, um, and, you know, I don't have really any, I just really want to make that clear. I have no personal financial interest in, in any of these vaccines. So in vaccine development, you always have to start with the antigen, um, you know, the enemy, so to speak. So we all know the coronavirus and what it looks like now. That's the particle on the left. And the spike protein, which is shown here in red, is kind of dotted around the surface. And it's really the primary target for our immune system. This was true for SARS-CoV-2, but also for previously known coronaviruses. So on the right side is the spike protein. It's the structure that was actually resolved um, by electron microscopy in the spring. 
This is from SARS-CoV-2. And I point it out because it is the critical protein in all of the vaccines. And at the very top of this protein, which is in green, is this area of the spike protein called the receptor binding domain. And what it does is it, it actually, it, just as it says, it binds to the ACE2 receptor, which is on the outside of our cells. And so this is the, the critical point where the virus attaches to the cell and enters the cell and starts replicating. So the theory of vaccination is that if you can create antibodies that bind and cover that green domain, then you're gonna block and inhibit the ability of the virus to attach to the cell and replicate. So that's the critical mechanism by how we, we are, think these vaccines are gonna be working. We've learned a lot in the last few months about the natural immune response to SARS-CoV-2. When vaccines started development back in the spring, we actually didn't know anything about natural immunity and, and really didn't even know it was, if it was possible to develop immunity. Um, but we now know that humans do make a lot of antibodies. We also make um, our helper responses, which are our CD4 positive T cells and CD8 positive T cells for you guys who remember immunology. And during the setting of an acute infection, we don't have a great, um, our immune system hasn't seen the virus before. So all of that kind of learned response is not present yet. So um, really t maybe some T cell responses are, are helpful during acute infection, maybe a little bit of other responses, but really it's what we call our innate immunity that looks like the determining factor about whether we do well or don't do well during um, acute infection. So neutralizing antibodies, which are the antibodies that coat that spike protein and block it from infection, um, these really haven't uh, made a difference that much during acute infection, but they're very important for protective immunity against secondary infection. So on the right is a little table from a very elegant little study that I think kind of provides a lot of insight about uh, COVID-19. So this was a study, uh, kind of a natural experiment on a fishing boat where about 150 um, fishermen were going on a big fishing uh, you know, trip for about a month. And these fishermen got on the boat and they were all screened for SARS-CoV-2 with a one-time nasal PCR. Um, and then they also got some antibody testing done as well. So on that one-time screening, everybody was negative and they all got on the boat. But unfortunately, one of the fishermen was missed with the PCR, which can happen, right? Like if they're just developing an infection and their PCR actually um, was, was negative, but they were actually infected. And in the process of this fishing trip, um, 117 of these sailors, uh, or excuse me, 103 got infected. So it's a really amazing attack rate, meaning it's crazy how fast and how um, prevalent it was on this boat. But what these investigators found is when they went back and looked at the antibodies, the sailors that had really nice high neutralizing antibody responses, likely because they'd been infected previously, were protected. They were the ones that did not get infected during this trip. We're also learning about the durability of the natural immune response. Of course, this <clears throat> Uh, epidemic is less than a year old. So what we know about durability is also less than a year old. But it looks like antibodies really do stay fairly stable in levels over the course of about 68 months. Anti now, antibody levels decline naturally. All the, that's normal. They should decline. Um, and it's, that, that's not always the perfect <clears throat> excuse me, measure of our learned immune response because antibodies decline, but it doesn't mean that we've forgotten what the virus looks like. Um, but the figure on the right shows that kind of steady decline over time, but it's not that marked, like it doesn't go to zero. Now, whether or not these are neutralizing antibodies is harder to assess because that's actually a difficult um, assay or a test to do in the laboratory. Now, one thing I wanna point out from this figure that you can see is each of those little dots is a different person and you can see how variable it is, how heterogeneous it is. So there's a wide range in what antibody levels people get in the setting of natural immunity. So it's very hard to predict just because you've been infected before, it's hard to know whether you're gonna really have enough of an immune response to protect yourself. Um, and we'll find that out at some point, but we don't know it yet. 
But what these investigators found that I think is really important for vaccine development is that nearly everyone that they looked at developed B cell memory. So that's that learned response that is there so that you can instantly manufacture more antibodies as soon as you see the virus. And those levels of memory did not decline over 68 months, nor did the cellular immunity. So that's very hopeful that our vaccines will elicit a nice memory response that will persist over time. Now in vaccine development, we've all heard, and it's true, it, it takes years typically, many years to develop a vaccine. Sometimes that's science um, and, and that, a feature of the, of the virus. So HIV, there's, it's been 30 years, and this is what I work on almost entirely. Um, and we still don't have a, a vaccine and that's driven mostly by HIV itself. It's a very difficult virus. It mutates constantly. It has lots of scientific problems. But even for regular vaccines, it, it, it takes a long time. So there's two pathways in the traditional paradigm. <clears throat> there's a manufacturing pathway, and then there's the clinical trial testing pathway. And each of them have to work in order to, for you to succeed. Now in the traditional pathway, there are a lot of stopping points that are built in there by design. So these are put there because it's an, an incredible amount of money to invest in making a vaccine. And before people invest money, they usually want to see data. So for example, even for me, if I want to get a grant, you know, I applied for a grant to do some HIV vaccine work. It took a year at the NIH just to review the grant. Um, so <clears throat> think about that in the background, how long it takes to get started. In the manufacturing pathway though, usually what people do is make very small lots of the vaccine, do a phase one test, see how it does, and then they make bigger lots and then finally large scale manufacturing for global distribution. And each of these delays are built into the process um, and the timeline is many years. But there's a new kind of outbreak paradigm for vaccine development. And this really actually kicked off during the Zika outbreak in 2016, I think this is the first, that was the first time that I really saw this going forward, where the two pathways still exist, the manufacturing pathway and the clinical trial pathway. But now these stopping points have been removed. So the main reason you can remove them and why they were removed is because all the money and investment for this came first and upfront. So no one had to apply for any grants. Uh, there was no convincing that had to be done. The pharmaceutical industry governments, they flooded uh, this field with money. And that is why this really happened quickly. Manufacturing also critically began and moved to large scale manufacturing instantly without waiting for clinical data, meaning completely at risk. So these companies today that are they're telling us we, they have, you know, could have a billion doses, you know, that's because they started manufacturing those doses in the spring. Usually they would have waited for the phase three data to do that. And then in the clinical trial development space, phase one, meaning the first set of studies rolled instantly into phase two, rolled instantly into phase three, because the product was available to do that. And because all of the partners were lined up. But that doesn't mean that the process skipped any safety steps. So all of the same safety milestones still had to be reached. It's just that there was no break between this, the, the phases. So if you think about it like cooking, and I am not a good cook or a baker of any kind, but I know <laughs> the principles of baking, you know, you put the brownie mix into the oven, like it's gotta be in the oven for, whatever it is, like 40 minutes, and there's no way to make it any faster. So that's the safety element. Like it's gotta go into the oven for that amount of time. But how fast you buy the ingredients from the store, how fast you mix it on the table, how fast you serve it, you know, all of that, that's the part that gets accelerated. So the US government set up something that, um, they called it Operation Warp Speed, which nobody likes that title, but that is what it's called. <clears throat> and it was, two pathways, just like I talked about, the manufacturing pathway and the clinical trial pathway. So the manufacturing pathway was um, delegated to the army, really, the Department of Defense. And then the vaccine pathway and the trial pathway was delegated to the NIH to do. 
And what the NIH did is they created something called ACTIVE, which identified five candidate COVID-19 vaccines that they were going to invest in, and that these candidate vaccines would flow through uh, government-supported infrastructure that would have harmonized efficacy trials, collaborating networks, uh, collaborating labs, unified data and safety monitoring board, um, and a unified statistical group so that you could do between trial statistics. And the collaborating clinical trial network was formed and called the COVID-19 Prevention Network, or CoVPN. Now, how did they form a clinical trial network with hundreds of clinical trial sites in, instantly? Well, what they did is they turned to the HIV clinical trial network that is very extensive and has hundreds of investigators and sites or actually around the world. Um, and it's called, it, it was called HVTN. And what they did is they crossed out the word HIV and they put in the word COVID. And everybody got noticed that all the HIV investigators in all of our studies and all of our clinical trial units were going to pivot immediately and study COVID vaccines. So the COVID-19 vaccines that are in phase three trials in the US, I've outlined them here. I'm not definitely not gonna be able to go through all of them today. I'm actually gonna focus on the mRNA vaccines, but there are three platforms that are being tested. The mRNA vaccines, viral vector vaccines, which um, use in a virus that's been modified so it's harmless to deliver the uh, vaccine antigen and then protein-based vaccines, which are just the protein from itself. All of these use the same principle, which is that they're delivering the spike protein. Remember spike from the very first slide? They're delivering spike protein to the immune system so that we can learn what it looks like and be prepared for it. So they, they all do that. Uh, there's just different ways that they do that. So mRNA vaccines, they are definitely new. Um, in the sense that we have never rolled out an mRNA vaccine to this wide of a population. Um, but they're not new in concept, and they've always been, not always, but they've been started to be made over the last decade, and it's been known for a while that they have a lot of pandemic advantages. And in fact, a couple of years ago, the NIH, um, prodded on by Tony Fauci, be, said, you know, let's invest in mRNA vaccines and partner with some companies now so that if we have what they thought was going to be a bird flu pandemic, if we have that, then they can start working immediately. And the company that they partnered with was Moderna. So they created a contract that was in place long before coronavirus so that the instant there was a pandemic, Moderna could start working. And so that is actually a big part of why we are here today and why this was able to be done so quickly. So mRNA, um, for those of you who may have forgotten your high school science, and I have a figure coming, uh, is messenger RNA. And it is <clears throat> the instructions to the cell about how to make, in this case, the spike protein. So mRNA is translated in the cytosol, that's the outside of the nucleus part of the cell, into proteins. And then that protein is secreted into our circulation so that we can see it. And mRNA does not enter the nucleus of the cell or integrate into DNA. So it, doesn't have, it does not affect genetic, it can't change your genetics. Um, and it's a normal thing, like our, our body is full of mRNA. We have to, that's how we make all of our proteins. So it's degraded by normal cellular processes and it doesn't build up in the cell. And so it doesn't have persistent toxicities. Um, it can be efficient in vivo delivery. That means that we can deliver it into cells um, efficiently by putting it into carrier molecules. And in the case of our most recent mRNA vaccines, those are lipid nanoparticles. So anti-vector immunity, which would be the viral vector vaccines, those are avoided. Um, and mRNA vaccines can be administered repeatedly. And for pandemics, what's important is that they have the potential for very rapid, very inexpensive and scalable manufacturing. They have the potential. They haven't reached fully inexpensive manufacturing, but they're definitely rapid. So here's your figure um, of your old cell. So up on the top right, excuse me, top left is a nanoparticle that is the delivery vehicle and it carries the mRNA for spike protein. 
and it's taken up into a cell. It, it just is naturally absorbed into the cell. Once it's in the cell, that lipid nanoparticle is released and then very quickly broken down within the cell and then degrades and is gone and does not persist. The RNA is released and then the RNA is translated into the protein, which is that squiggly yellow snake. And then the protein is secreted out of the cell. And in this case, it's the spike protein. Once that process is done, like I said, the lipid nanoparticle is completely degraded and the mRNA is degraded. And so there's nothing left in your cell after this process is done. So here are some of the basic pros and cons, and we're still learning about the safety of mRNA vaccines. But it's interesting, mRNA vaccines were developed partially because they were expected to be far safer than current vaccine technologies. So for one thing, they cannot reassemble into the infectious virus. So they only make a spike protein. You need 25 proteins if you want to make a full coronavirus. The other, as I said, is that it's degraded by normal physiologic processes. So it doesn't build up toxicity. It doesn't enter into the nucleus or have any impact on our genetics. But really importantly, it's very clean and fast manufacturing. Basically just kind of print it out. You print out all this mRNA. So most vaccines or the ones we're familiar with, like influenza, you actually have to grow it in, a, in an egg. That's why you can't have, you know, they, there are all those questions about egg allergies. And a lot of vaccines are grown in cell lines. And so there's a lot of points in that process where you can have serious contamination issues. And so there's a lot of um, production and purification steps. For mRNA vaccines, there's really far less chance of contamination because you don't have to grow it in any kind of cell line. And we now know that since it's been tested in more than 70,000 people at this point, that at least in short-term follow-up, it's very well tolerated. Now, what are the downsides, uh, potential downsides? So one is that in the oncology space, they've done a lot of research um, using mRNA to deliver important proteins that are you know, maybe missing um, or to deliver, <clears throat> um, right, so exactly. So deliver proteins that might help to clear cancers. Um, and when they did that in the past without any kind of um, carrier molecule, it did stimulate the immune response. So people did have a lot of symptoms after that. And there's a theoretical issue that the immune system might look at that mRNA and develop an immune response to the mRNA, not to the protein, which can confuse the body and potentially trigger some sort of autoimmune response. So that has not been observed for any of these vaccines. The lipid nanoparticle, where it's, which is like a lipid droplet that is, suspends the mRNA, that itself can cause symptoms because it looks a little foreign. So your body looks at that as like, why is that drop of oil in my blood? And you get symptoms from that. Um, and then the long-term safety is unknown for mRNA vaccines. So we, spec we, we speculate that the safety will be fine. However, it hasn't been, proven yet because we have, don't have that safety. So it's been more than two, we, we have about a few hundred people who've gotten vaccines for infectious diseases with mRNA vaccines. Um, and we do have long-term safety for those individuals over the course of two years, but um, that's not a lot of people. So <clears throat> let's talk about the Pfizer vaccine. So we have seen now the phase three study results. So when I say phase three and how we test these vaccines, what do I mean? So there are all of these trials are structured the same way, which is that you take a huge number of people and you randomly assign half of them to get the vaccine and half of them to get the placebo. You counsel them all to wear masks, you tell them what they're supposed to do to prevent infection, but a lot of them are still very high risk and they do get infected. So you watch them over time. Now you don't have a set time that you're gonna watch them. What you're actually doing is counting up how many infections occur and when you've counted up enough infections and the statisticians help us figure out that number, then you go back and you open the book and you see, okay, of all those infections, who, who got the vaccine and who got the placebo? Now, if the vaccine doesn't work, you know, the numbers are gonna be the same in both groups. Okay, there was no difference. So this is what they saw when they opened the book for Pfizer. And I should tell you what, how do they count up the cases? So what they're doing is that if, they do surveillance for symptoms. So if a participant has um, 
any kind of symptom, they notify the team and then they come in and they get tested. And if it's positive, that counts as a case. So when they opened up the books, <clears throat> there were about 170 cases and 162 of those cases were in the placebo group and only eight of them were in the vaccine group. And that comes out to be 95% effective. And then looking across this, there, you know, it's hard to break out eight cases, but <clears throat> really there was no, nothing particular about those eight cases. It wasn't like all eight cases were in people over you know, 65. There really was no difference um, across age, gender, race, and ethnicity. And efficacy was shown in adults over 65 years old. So there were no serious safety concerns that were observed. Serious meaning like permanent, um, unchangeable side effects. A lot of people have, do have symptoms. Um, it's very common for people to have arm pain. It's very common for people to feel that kind of flu-like syndrome and that those symptoms are actually worse the second time you get the vaccine. Um, and fatigue and headache, those are very common. But these, it's important to know that those vaccine, those symptoms that people get are transient. So they last um, a day or two and then they wear off. And you know, maybe the arm pain can go as long as a week, but these are not permanent side effects. Pfizer has said that they've made 50 million vaccine doses to be used by the end of 2020, which we now see distributed. This is for the United States. And then about 1.3 billion doses um, worldwide by the end of 2021. And the US has access to 100 million doses total for Pfizer. This is the, <clears throat> excuse me, the figure that came out um, showing the data from Pfizer. And I show this figure because I feel like it's like miraculous, and we may never see anything like this again in science. Um, it's just, you can see it. You don't need to be a statistician to know that there's a difference between this red line, which are the people who got placebo, and this blue line, which are the people who got vaccine. These are the cumulative incidents, meaning these are cases, case, 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 case in a placebo group, and very few cases along the way um, for vaccine. So now we get to Moderna. Moderna's vaccine is very similar to Pfizer's. In fact, it may actually be essentially identical. No one quite knows what's happening, what happened in the manufacturing process, but they are, you know, in terms of, um, you know, proprietary information, but basically they're exactly the same. And the, the studies were structured exactly the same way and the results were exactly the same. There were 185 cases among placebos and 11 cases among vaccines. They also were more successful, um, but though I think Pfizer is showing this now too, that they really reduced severe cases. So there were 30 severe cases um, in, in the study and all of them were in the placebo group. So there were no zero, 30,000 people, zero severe cases of COVID-19 among the people who got the vaccine, which is unbelievable efficacy. The safety picture is identical um, to Pfizer. Symptoms are mild to moderate and transient. They're worse the second time around. They are not no symptoms. These are in a spectrum from the flu shot to Shingrix, it's in the middle. So it's more symptoms than a flu shot, fewer symptoms than the shingles vaccine. Inventory, they say they have 20 million doses by the end of 2020 and then a billion doses by 2021. And here's their figure that came out and it also is beautiful and it looks very similar to Moderna and it's just lovely. Both of those figures, by the way, have a very interesting phenomenon. These, these vaccines are given two times um, and it was assumed based on early data that the, a single dose would not be effective. However, before people get the second dose, you can already see a separation in these two lines. So this is days, so by two weeks, they start to separate. So there's a lot of interest now about, hey, maybe a single dose is effective and maybe we should study that. So my interpretation of this data, so really when this came out, it was just like shocking and amazing to everybody that, I mean, it was proof. Immunity to COVID-19 is possible. This was new information. We really didn't know that for sure, apart from like a little study in those fishermen. mRNA vaccines, we know now they work extraordinarily well in the short term. 
So we know in you know, a few months after vaccination, they just work extraordinarily well. We have some unknowns. So how long will this effect last? Will it drop off quickly? Um, will people need to be boosted at six months or a year? We don't know that yet. We don't know about all populations of people. We don't have data specifically in pregnant women or in children. We don't have safety data beyond two months of follow-up. Now keep in mind, most vaccines, any safety issues, 99.9% .9 of safety issues come in the first two months. That's why they pick that number. Uh, it's very rare for a vaccine to have a safety issue that's picked up after two months. With, we don't know if they prevent asymptomatic infection because we didn't look for that in these studies. And we don't know for sure if these vaccines prevent transmission of the virus to other people. We are very hopeful that with this level of efficacy, that they also prevent transmission to others. And there's an assumption, I think, among many that that's the case, but that has not been definitively proven. And then mRNA is a little bit unstable. Um, and so it really needs to be very cold. And so I, you might have heard that you need to have these in like deep freezers. So based on these things that we just don't know yet, it's very important that people who are vaccinated still wear a mask and that we all still wear a mask, that we don't stop our usual social distancing. Now, Pfizer got emergency use authorization and uh, there are some of those big trucks that rolled out. And then we've all seen recent pictures from our own institutions of the vaccine arriving and us actually starting to get vaccinated, which is amazing. Um, and then Moderna had their meeting yesterday where it was recommended, the experts recommended that it was um, approved. And so that will probably be approved in the next day or two as well. Now I say approved, it's not actually approved, it's authorized under an emergency use um, provision of like during a pandemic and the official approval will come later and it may be rescinded if the emergency goes away. Um, but for all purposes, we think of it as basically the FDA saying, okay, it's okay to give it. Now the ACIP is the advisory committee on immunization, immunization practices. And that committee is the group that is um, making recommendations to the Centers for Disease Control and those recommendations goes to the state about how they would prioritize populations. So the phase one group is a large group of people. These are all the people that should be getting priority. Um, and they do include you know, adults over 65 years old and adults with high risk medical conditions. But really the key question that we're all looking at now is this 1A group, who should get it like first first? And most places have determined that it's healthcare personnel um, and then long-term LTCF is long-term care facility residents, so nursing homes. So people who live in nursing homes and people who work in nursing homes. Now I wanna add a few more details that the CDC has put out to help us with the de details, right? It's all in the details. So now these vaccines are rolling out. So the CDC has given some advice. So what to do about allergies? We know now that when this is going to be true for any, any product that's rolled out over a million people, you're going to start picking up allergic reactions. So they have made this table that helps us think through them. So basically, you can proceed with vaccination with almost any kind of history of an allergy. Um, they just want you to observe people for, you know, potentially up to 30 minutes. The people who should not get the vaccine are in red, and it says a history of severe allergic reaction to any component of the vaccine. So this is a new vaccine, right? So how does anybody have a, a allergy to any component? Well, the lip, we think probably something in the lipid nanoparticle and probably um, PEG, which is polyethylene glycol that's in there. And we have a lot of medications that use PEG, PEG interferon, you know, um, and that can cause allergic reactions. So that will play out, I think, um, as people kind of identify what the allergen is. And then there were patients that weren't included in the trials that we don't have a lot of data on. So really immunocompromising conditions like bone marrow translate, uh, transplant, pregnancy, lactation. So they may proceed with vaccination and <clears throat> they just have some nuances with it. And then precautions would be anyone who shows up for a vaccine and they're feeling really sick that day, just like with all vaccines, we usually wait and see what's going on. So just a moment to talk about pregnancy. 
So the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists have come out with their recommendations for vaccinating pregnant and lactating patients. And so this is how they look at it. Um, so COVID-19 vaccines should not be withheld from pregnant individuals who meet the criteria for vaccination based on ACIP recommended priority groups. What that means is healthcare workers uh, should not be withheld from pregnant healthcare workers. They should be offered to lactating individuals as well. And that a conversation with the clinician may be helpful, but it should not be required prior to vaccination as this may cause unnecessary barriers. And basically they're putting this decision in the hands of the woman, which I think is, I think personally is appropriate. And that pregnancy testing should not be a requirement. And one of the big reasons they feel this way is that an mRNA, well, first of all, getting COVID is very bad when you're pregnant and you're at risk for very severe outcomes. Um, but also the mRNA vaccines, like I said, they don't have any impact on genetics. They don't get into the nucleus by design. And so there is um, good confidence that they'll be safe. So getting towards, and I do have to speed up, I realize, I, um, so that we have time for everyone's questions. But if you recall, there were many platforms that CoVPN was investigating, and Moderna was the first one in this platform. Pfizer did this on their own. But the other ones in the pipeline are AstraZeneca, which I could talk for an hour about, but that vaccine I won't be able to talk about today. Um, and then Johnson & Johnson vaccine, uh, Novavax vaccine, and then um, Platform 5 was Sanofi, but probably they're going to drop out because they had a lot of problems with manufacturing. Um, and these other vaccines fill different niches. So they have much easier storage conditions. Um, they may have clear single dose regimens and they have deeper safety databases. So just a moment to talk about work that we're doing in our group. So down at Beth Israel Deaconess, I work uh, in the Center for Virology and Vaccine Research and with my mentor, Dr. Dan Baruch. And we started working on a vaccine back in January. So just to give some flavor to this, um, my claim to fame is my email to Dan on January 10th, um, where <clears throat> I said, this was released today, saw someone link to it on Twitter, and I put a link to the genome that was published in China for SARS-CoV-2. And so the next day we begin meetings to develop the vaccine. And here's a picture from our January 31st meeting and some of my notes, because I knew it was gonna be a big deal. Um, so here is our coronavirus lab meeting, the 31st of January, to find the protective antigens, five different spike proteins. So um, that, and most of that work was done by Dan's group and his amazing postdocs. So uh, our group was able to show that the vaccine, um, this vaccine that we developed based on an adenovirus vector, protected monkeys, and that was published in Science in July. And then we started the phase one trial at the end of July. Um, and our group did a sub-study of 25 participants that was a comprehensive immunology study. And we enrolled that study in two weeks. And then we and other groups did safety. And when we got our data, one month of data, at some, in the beginning of September, the phase three trial began. And that phase three study is now actually finished and rolling. And the readout should be in January. So I'm gonna end up talking a little bit um, about a bigger picture about society. So let's talk about COVID-19 population immunity um, and how we can achieve it with vaccination. And when I say population immunity, I mean herd immunity. I just hate the word herd because it makes us all sound like animals. Um, but these this population immunity. So our goal with um, is to reduce, if we want to stop the pandemic, so not just protect ourselves from in, in deaths, but actually stop this pandemic, we need to reduce what we call the reproduction number. So that's how many people are infected by each person. So right now each infected person transmits to roughly two and a half other people. But if we can get it down so that each infected person transmits to less than one person, well then our pandemic is going, going to end. So we can reduce this with a vaccine. And to do that, that depends on you know, how infectious the virus is, um, and then how effective our vaccine is in blocking transmission. Like I said, we don't actually know that number. It could be less than the 95%. It could be maybe only 70%. But the biggest factor is how many people are vaccinated in a given social circle. 
And the estimates of what is the vaccination level that we need to achieve for herd immunity ranges from 60 to 80 percent, uh, depending on our estimate of how effective the vaccine will be for this. So <clears throat> this brings me to the importance of broad vaccination uptake. So when we calculate this number, we're talking about a national vaccination level, but that really assumes that vaccination is randomly distributed. Um, however, if coverage is low in one community, then outbreaks are going to continue in that community. And so why would coverage differ by community? So definitely distribution barriers, so rural areas, areas that don't have deep freezers, for example. Um, and then vaccine mistrust and hesitancy. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Some of that are disinformation and conspiracy theories. But a lot of it is based on, you know, just trying to understand how did we get here so quickly? What's the safety data of these vaccines? You know, how can I be sure this is safe? So, you know, legitimate questions that people have. There are, so what's the risk of having disparate vaccine uptake? So one is the risk to society at large. So if you have an uncontrolled outbreak in one community, that can be a reservoir of infection for other communities. But then it also can increase health disparities be between populations. So um, subpopulations, these can break out many different ways, but they can break out by race and ethnicity, geography, economics, religion, politics. Uh, I think we all know now about the um, very disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on Black and Hispanic or Latinx populations. This figure to me really says it all. These are the excess U.S. deaths by race and ethnicity. And among, among whites, there's definitely an excess of deaths, most of which are, are attributed to COVID-19. But the spikes among Blacks and Hispanics are just, you know, unbelievably different. <laughs> And we live in a situation with really persistent geographic and economic segregation. This is um, Boston, Suffolk County. And I pulled this from current statistics. So this is looking um, on what percent of people who live on a particular block, what percent are white and you know by ethnicity. And then the other figure on the right is what percent are black. So on the left by block, those blocks that are in red have 80 to 100% of people are white. And then the blocks on, on the right that are red are 80 to 100% black. So this is today in our in Boston where I live, but you can see that there is tremendous segregation by where we live in this city that really will make a difference. So if you're talking about herd immunity among these white neighborhoods, you know that may not apply to herd immunity within these black neighborhoods because they don't mix as much as we think they do. And confidence in a vaccine is much lower among Black communities than it is in white communities. Now, this is a figure from September, which was probably the low point of confidence in these vaccines that showed only 32% of Black Americans would be willing to get a vaccine, a COVID vaccine. Now, keep in mind, this is right before the election. And this is when uh, Donald Trump was talking about influencing the FDA, firing people if they didn't approve a vaccine instantly. This is when people's confidence levels really plummeted. Now, these days, the confidence levels are getting much better, and that's good news. So nowadays, among Blacks, 62% are saying that they definitely or probably would get the vaccine. But it's still not the same as what you see among Whites. It's 73% among Whites. And I do think that these numbers are very fluctuating. And estimates show that coverage for herd immunity are probably somewhere at least 60% or above. So there's definitely a risk here for disparate herd immunity between these communities. And I can't even get into about the global picture. And so here I'm just talking, I was talking about the United States, but when we're talking about the rest of the world, uh, it's gonna be a long time before Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, is able to get these vaccines. So let me end here and summarize. Um, we now know that immunity against COVID-19 is possible. We've observed it in humans following infection and we can see now that it happens after vaccination. And we actually didn't know that at all. So that's a huge scientific discovery. Um, we also know that vaccines against COVID-19 will work for individuals, meaning for the person who gets a vaccine, it's going to prevent symptoms and it's going to prevent severe disease, at least over a short period of time, like a couple of months. 
Um, but, and we, the other platforms, just keep in mind, the other platforms that are being studied have the same scientific hypothesis that if you have antibodies to spike protein, you'll have uh, protection. And so we believe that these are also going to be effective. Um, so we understand that probably we'll need to optimize these vaccines and we may need to boost them if we want to have durable protection, like over a year worth of protection. But I just want to end by emphasizing that population or herd immunity against COVID-19 may really be challenging. Um, and that's because of inventory distribution and access barriers and also vaccine hesitancy and mistrust. So I have a lot of people to acknowledge, but I really just want to call out the clinical, critical, uh, clinical trial participants um, because I don't think people really realize or give enough like hero worship to these people. So more than 100,000 people in the United States have volunteered to be tested with these experimental vaccines, just the mRNA vaccines in the middle of a pandemic without knowing whether it would work just for the benefit of us, our neighbors, our friends, and our family. And I think it's really, with everything that is so negative sometimes, I think we need to step back and think about what the tremendous generosity that people have um, demonstrated with this. This is my little crew that runs our clinical trial unit and um, it's full of young people. And so they've decided they're gonna do an Instagram takeover. <laughs> Uh, and they're gonna do that on December 21st. So anyone who wants to follow the BIDMC Instagram, you can learn um, about what we all do day to day in our unit and how we're all real people and uh, you know how we're getting these vaccines tested. Okay, let me end there, stop share. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Katie. That was terrific, really comprehensive. And it actually answered a lot of the questions that we had. Um, I think it's great to kind of allay some of the fears that are out there um, in the general public about vaccination. Um, I'm going to start with a couple of questions um, first about the efficacy, in fact, the fantastic efficacy that we've seen with the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. And so when we think about traditional viral vaccines, like the flu vaccine, um, and we don't see efficacy rates nearly that high, what do you attribute that to? And, and how is it even plausible that these COVID-19 vaccines are so efficacious? Um, that is a great question. I think we're all pretty familiar now that the flu shot, some year at best, a flu shot is 60% protective. Um, and at worst, it can go down to like 30%. So why, why is that? And why does that change from year to year? And the driver for that is because influenza mutates pretty rapidly. So from year to year, the proteins, its version of the spike protein changes. So if you can imagine, if you need to make, we need to make new vaccines against influenza every year because the spike, their spike protein changes. And we have to, because we have to grow it in eggs and it takes time, we have to guess a year in advance almost what we think that protein is gonna look like. So often we guess well, and a lot of times we don't guess well. And that's why you get the big mismatch. Um, that's a big fa factor for it. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is very similar. It has to do with the conserv evolution and conservation of the spike protein on the coronavirus itself. And do we have any data or information yet on um, how much conservation or variability there is in that spike protein? There's some variability. Um, there's been data now showing some mutations that have taken over um, and changed a little bit across um, geography. It's unclear yet how those are affecting how pathogenic the virus is. But in terms of vaccines, um, well, one good thing is that, that that's actually a very low rate of change, like one or two amino acids over the course of a huge pandemic, um, which is awesome. I wish in HIV we can only dream of seeing those few changes. Um, but the data so far, at least looking at animal studies and in vitro studies, is that vaccine immunity will likely be fairly broad meaning that the antibodies that we develop against certain, the spike protein now ought to be protective against other versions. Um, but that will need to be tested in the field. Awesome. Um, you spoke a little bit about the immunostimulatory properties of mRNA and sometimes the lipid. Um, is there any, I mean, I think everyone in the back of their mind worries, right? Is there a concern about the vaccine causing profound autoimmune diseases or even to the point of something like lymphoma? I think there's a there's a healthy fear that some people have about that. Could you speak to that topic? Yeah, I mean, I think 
the, especially in the beginning when the mRNA was introduced like without any kind of carrier and you just gave IV, like high dose IV infusions of mRNA, um, that was a setting when people were first most concerned about it. I actually haven't seen any evidence of really se any severe autoimmune disease elicited by that. That's in the oncology space. Um, but that, first of all, there was a couple of um, modifications made to the mRNA, a couple of amino acid changes that were made so that it doesn't look like human mRNA anymore. So our immune system won't necessarily get confused. And then also by coating it in the lipid, it also protects it. But having said that, I don't want to oversell or overemphasize the fact that the long-term safety of these vaccines is unknown. And so it's really risk benefit. If you're at risk of having severe COVID-19 and dying of it, well, then your decision-making is going to be different about your risk for those long-term theoretical side effects. Is there any risk of, say, a reverse transcriptase acting on that mRNA and incorporating it to the host genome? Um, so there was some conversation about that um, from the non-virology people. Uh, reverse transcriptase is an enzyme that is used to um, reverse transcribe RNA back into DNA, which then potentially could get integrated. And we have reverse transcriptases found for people who have HIV infection. Um, for, but talking to my HIV friends, uh, they tell me that the reverse transcriptase that is in HIV uh, doesn't have the correct primers on it to attach and reverse transcribe mRNA from the vaccine. That's reassuring, thank you. Um, so our next question is about um, immunocompromised individuals, right? So um, the FDA is recommending that immunocompromised individuals be vaccinated. Can you speak a little bit to those who are on immunosuppression and how their immune response may um, factor in to providing long-term efficacy for them or even short-term efficacy? Yeah, I mean, I think the feeling is that it, it, the safety profile is probably going to be the same so that there's not really an, a new safety issue with put, giving the vaccine. It's really just what you said about, will, will it be as effective? Um, and that we just don't know. Um, hopefully we're gonna get to a point really pretty soon where we can actually measure people's antibodies after vaccination and look and see like did the antibody titers get high enough. And if they didn't, then we could just boost, boost, boost. And you, you touched on this in the beginning with the, um, the natural immunity. If a vaccine is able to stimulate, stimulate the immune system and you are able to form either B or T cells that recognize that spike protein, why wouldn't immunity last for more than several months? Why couldn't the body call on those cells later down the line? Well, we're very hopeful that it will last <laughs> a long time. Uh, so this is just a bunch, scientists are super cautious, right? We don't wanna over promise what we don't know. Um, we are very hopeful that in fact, it would be longer. Uh, we work in our group on the, this Adenovirus 26 platform and we've been working on it for a long time and it shows quite durable immune responses over several years. Um, you just never want to tell people something until you know it's true. Right, sounds like sound advice. Um, so our, our next question has to do with the type of vaccine um, and the length of immunity as well. The fact that the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines are based on mRNA, and then the other um, companies are based on other um, platforms, is there anything inherent to the platform that would suggest the length of immunity or the efficacy? Yeah, so there's some assumptions maybe that mRNA and the viral vector vaccines will elicit a longer and more durable immune response. And the reason then than just a protein shot, and the reason for that is that the protein shot is basically very simple. You make a lot of spoke, spike protein, you put it in a syringe and you just inject it into somebody. But that just that spike protein just kind of floats around and it degrades and your immune system sees different parts of it, not necessarily looking that natural. When you introduce mRNA or a viral vector that introduces this, this sequence into the cell itself, the cell secretes that protein into circulation in a, in a much more natural way. So it looks like the protein I showed on the first slide and instead of a bunch of floppy peptides or things that the immune system, it doesn't look at all like the virus. So the hope there is that if it looks like the virus and it's expressed through a cell, that that will actually make the immune system generate a much more accurate immune and comprehensive immune response. Okay, that's really helpful. Um, so the next question gets at delivering a vaccine in the midst of a pandemic. 
So what do you think the effect would be? Let's say someone gets vaccinated and they're actually in the incubation stage of infection. Is there a risk to them? How would that affect their immunity? Do we know? We don't know. It probably is no risk to them. Um, it might just not, it, it might not be effective because you haven't really learned anything yet. It takes a couple of weeks. Um, but it's possible that it may be effective because we saw that after a single dose, after only two weeks or even seven days, there was a little bit of protection. And we know from the monoclonal antibody literature that if you deliver an antibody in the setting of very early infection, that that's when it's most effective. So I wouldn't rule it out, but I don't know for sure if it would be effective. Okay, and a similar question. What if for some reason one person got the first vaccine with Pfizer and then for whatever reason they cross over? Is there a danger in that? You know, it's really interesting. I've been thinking, I think that's going to happen a lot, <laughs> uh, a lot of mixing. Um, so I don't think there's a danger to it. I actually think it may help. We do a lot of HIV studies where we mix and match. And if you do, um, for example, an adenovirus vector vaccine first and then boost with the protein, you get an exponentially higher immune response. It actually helps. So it'll be interesting to see. We need to follow it and make sure that there's no issues, but I actually think it will help. Wow, that's fascinating. So um, I'm gonna switch over to some um, pregnancy related questions because we've had a lot of questions in the question board as well as amongst the faculty. So the first question I think is something that's out there in the popular media um, or social media, I should say, is a concern about a placental protein. I think that has um, some similarities. Is there any um, actual factual or scientific basis for concern regarding that? Um, I don't know if there's any basis for concern because I think it's normal to be concerned, but I think there's no evidence um, that there's any issue in that regard. I have a, a good colleague who's really an expert in um, infections and vaccination during pregnancy, and she went through it with me with the blast and all the rest and convinced me that there wasn't a concern. Perfect. And then similarly, I think there's concern, you know, pregnant patients were not included in these trials, but I'm wondering, I mean, would you agree with the statement that very few drug or vaccine trials would include pregnant patients um, out in any, in any sense? Um, I think so that it's not a, um, there shouldn't be an underlying mistrust that pregnant patients were excluded. Is that uh, fair to say? That is definitely fair to say uh, that is completely accurate. Um, they were not excluded because of any perceived safety issue. They were excluded because uh, that's how it's always done. Um, and <clears throat> I have to say that it's actually a big point of advocacy for, for me and my colleagues, because now you can see that what happens. So when you, you think you're protecting a vulnerable population by excluding them from a trial because you want to study it separately and not know more carefully, but then you end up in a situation like this where you have a national, I don't want to say experiment, but now a lot of pregnant people are getting vaccinated and you, you could have studied this more rigorously if you just included them in the phase three study to begin with. Great, thank you. Um, so we have a question about asymptomatic carrier status. So I know the trials were not designed to look for this and this is a big thing, right? Just because they didn't look at it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. But could you explain immunologically how can you have protection against a symptomatic infection and still be a carrier? And how could the virus replicate to the um, degree in order for you to become infectious if you yourself were pre protected? So we actually saw this phenomenon in monkeys. So in monkey studies that were vaccinated, this is both with the Moderna vaccine and also our own 26 vaccine, um, that if you vaccinate monkeys and then you infect them, you challenge them with the virus, you clear the virus from the lower respiratory tract. So if you do like BAL, you know, you get, you know, bronchoalveolar lavage fluid from the lower respiratory tract with cleared virus. And that correlates with what we see in humans of having less severe disease and symptoms. However, you don't clear it as well from the upper respiratory tract. And in that whole upper respiratory tract, that's actually the primary site of replication. So it's more intense there, it's a higher load of virus. So what they found is that <clears throat> over the course of several days, uh, a subset of these monkeys still had persistent nasal replication of the virus, even though they had no otherwise outward signs of symptoms of the virus. And 
So they themselves didn't get really sick. However, they could potentially cough that out and maybe transmit it to another monkey. And that's okay, right. great. <laughs> so that's, I guess, the impetus for still wearing a mask, obviously, amongst other reasons. Yeah. I'm going to ask you with your clinical dry, uh, director hat, clinical trial director hat, how do you foresee these um, vaccines being studied in children um, and other populations that weren't included? And will, it, will we see studies in them or will it just be um, kind of an extrapolation of data that we already have? So we're definitely gonna see studies. Um, there is a lot going on to plan those um, or even roll them out already. I think Pfizer's already started a kid study. Um, <clears throat> but these studies are not gonna be the huge 40,000 person efficacy studies that we've seen now um, because we don't have to do it that way. What we're gonna find soon is what we call an immune correlate of protection meaning we're going to find out in these studies among the people that were protected with the vaccine, what level of antibodies did they achieve? And then we know, okay, if we just test for that level of antibodies, we should know whether or not like that kid would be, have been protected or not. So those are called immunobridging studies. So the assumption is that both in pregnancy and in kids, we can do much smaller scale and faster studies just by vaccinating them, testing for safety, and making sure that we hit the same target level of antibodies. Great. Um, I will say we have about 10 minutes left. We have uh, uh, several more questions. If we don't get to everyone's question that I'm reading um, from the Q&A, please note that we'll try to get those answered for you either on Monday or perhaps on some of our um, Twitter feeds or the hospital website. Um, so Kate, this has been fascinating. Um, one question that just came up was about um, the lipid carrier for the mRNA, uh, mRNA vaccines and potential side effects in terms of, you know, people complain of a headache and some emboli syndrome. Can you speak to that and the uh, potential concerns about uh, lipid carriers? So I haven't seen anything about emboli syndromes. These are tiny. Um, these are very, very tiny microscopic. Like you saw in the picture, like they have to enter into a cell. So I don't think you're gonna see clumps of these uh, causing emboli. In terms of the reaction, so yes, they're, they do cause, um, the headache and probably are a factor in the increased fatigue and fever that people are getting. There may be an upside to that. So whenever the immune system is revved up, it actually can generate a bigger immune response. It's a kind of an adjuvant property, we call it. So it may not be a bad thing that the lipid um, raises a, a flag for the immune system to come and check this, this whole thing out. Um, where I think I see potential, I actually saw something really interesting from the Moderna study yesterday that, that was presented to the FDA yesterday um, about allergic reactions happening potentially in people. There was like three people who had bad allergic reactions that had had cosmetic fillers done with probably similar lipid-like molecules. Um, so it really raises some interesting things that we may see at the population level that people who are exposed to some of these interesting lipid products before may be primed for an immune response. It's super rare, but I, I think this is what we're going to find out now in the, the larger rollout of these vaccines. Oh, okay, great. One of our um, leaders in the group practice actually had a question about the Moderna vaccine versus the Pfizer. Were there more concerns about safety? Um, the Moderna vaccine, there was a request for, I guess, additional information? Um, no, I think the take home messages and safety is pretty much identical because they're pretty much identical vaccines. Um, like I said, they may actually be identical. We don't know um, because, you know, they don't publish how they exactly made these things. Um, they're essentially identical. Right. I'll note um, too that Dr. Calderwood is actually actively answering some questions in the Q&A board. Um, as well. Uh, I'll, I'll throw out one more question and then I don't know if Dr. Talbot and Dr. Calder would also like to comment, but if someone, let's say someone already had antibodies or they didn't know they had antibodies and then they received the vaccine, I mean, there, we can talk about the ethical um, implications of receiving a vaccine if you've been infected on Monday, but in terms of the biologic response, if you've already been infected, can you speak to that a little bit? So, what would be, you know, we're thinking through like what would be the impact? And I think there's no concern about safety in that setting. Um, but just would it like decrease your immune response, number one? Um, so, no, it looks like the data that's coming out of these studies is, and they, they actually will be able to look at this really formally um, because they 
they were agnostic to whether people had antibodies when they enrolled, so they'll be able to go back and see. But it looks like it doesn't have any impact on the immunogenicity. If anything, maybe it'll actually boost it because you've been primed. You have your prime from your first infection, and so the vaccine is a boost. Um, the other question, which is more, I think maybe you'll talk about it on Monday, is you know, should we be vaccinating these individuals because maybe they're already immune? Right now we are because we don't know what level of antibody is required for protection yet. So it's not like we could pre-screen people who've been vaccinated and know whether or not they shouldn't get the vaccine. Awesome. I think we actually have one more time or maybe one more question. Um, what if someone doesn't get the booster vaccine? I know, you've, we, you know we have a suggestion that um, people will have some type of response at least above placebo after one shot. But what if they wait, say, three months, four months, five months? Do we know? Is it the same as going back to normal? Yeah, in just one shot? Do we have any idea? We have no idea. Okay. And where did that three to four week window come from? Um, that came from, first of all, phase one. And that's why we do phase one and two studies. Um, but also previous coronavirus vaccine effort. So there was a vaccine effort for SARS-CoV-1, um, the original SARS, where some of this stuff was worked out. But in the phase one data, they also looked at different doses, different schedules. And that's why they thought it wasn't going to work at all after one dose, because the antibody titers are very low after one dose. So it's really intriguing that there was, an, it looked like some partial protection. Great. Dr. Talbot, Dr. Culver, do you have any questions for Dr. Stevenson at this time? Um, I'd, well, I'd just like to say how um, really timely and wonderful it is to have your expertise with us, Dr. Stevenson, because these are many questions that I myself have had, in particular, um, the recent uh, discussion regarding um, what if uh, someone has had disease before. I think that um, you, we can say with confidence that there's not a safety signal. It's not going to be antibody enhancement or any problem such like that. But in terms of my current role with the state, a lot of what we're asking is who, who should go first. Um, and um, therefore, we, we are trying to provide some um, practical guidance while we're in this stage of extreme vaccine limitation so that um, those who are within three months of their infection um, may want to allow those who don't have known confirmed disease to, to vaccinate first in some of these really controlled prioritized populations. Um, I, I see you nodding your head as though you think that that is a reasonable strategy. Um, the three month cutoff has been used in lots of different public health approaching. Um, so I, I do think it's reasonable. I mean, you guys are facing some impossible decisions um, with difficult uh, with triaging, basically, you've got to triage. So my perspective from a scientist would be like, we don't know, seems like you should vaccinate them. But from a triaging perspective, that's different. We know who it works the most in and the efficacy. So I, I agree. I think it makes sense to triage that way. I'd also like to say the, the um, comment for proceed with caution for, for example, pregnant and lactating women is very difficult to translate to mass vaccination clinic. You know, so, so we have an army of vaccinators who we provide training and we're expecting to have you know, thousands of throughput. Um, and what happens when that woman drives up and says, I, I don't know, I might be pregnant. You know, that, that this is a moment okay. of um, difficulty. So, so CDC at the um, ivory tower is not, not really helping so much with regards to how to translate something like proceed with caution when we're doing these max, mass vaccination clinics for the- um, Yeah. I like the um, some of the wording and language coming out of ACOG because they've been clearer saying like, you don't even think you need to be counseled really. Like you don't need to have a conversation with a clinician and you don't need pregnancy testing and really you should go for it. But you all, you all know that when patients present themselves, they might offer that. So again, how do we empower, enable our, yeah. our vaccinators to react to the woman who says, oh, wait a second, I forgot to tell you I'm pregnant. Is that okay? You know, that, that we need to, yeah. to script it all. We need to have confidence and, and be able to um, make this happen for New Hampshire and, and, and our communities. 
And I, you know, I think that as we're coming to the end, I, I do want to just end on a, on a message of, of hope because we, we now are at a time where we are beginning to roll out this mass vaccination that is a changing of the tides and it is exciting to see. And, and Katie, uh, it is great to see you and it's just a phenomenal uh, talk. It's been amazing to watch your uh, career since our, our training. I will say with our vaccination rolling out this week, it was really just jubilant. You saw a palpable sense of relief on the faces of those that were getting vaccinated and this feeling that there's finally a light at the end of the tunnel. And we will talk more on Monday about how this will play out both for our healthcare workers and across the state for everyone else that needs to be vaccinated. It is a Herculean effort. We've talked about that before, but it is beginning. It will get faster and faster and I'm just very excited. So thank you very much. I just was going to jump in to say like my last word about it is that personally, I am very excited to get my Pfizer vaccine. Um, and uh, I worked on ad 26, but I don't care. I am um, all lined up. I put my email in. I, you know, my, I just am like refresh, refresh, refresh. So on a personal note, I am very excited to get my vaccine. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah, we had three. Thank you so much, Katie. That was actually going to be my, con uh, my concluding question, whether our three infectious disease experts would take this vaccine. And it sounds like it's a resounding yes. yes. Um, terrific. So I want to thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, Katie, that was a terrific presentation. Um, can't thank you enough on behalf of our whole healthcare system, as well as our surrounding communities. This is information that everyone needs to hear. And I think it makes us feel much better, um, both optimistic um, for the future and also just more confident and comfortable as recipients of the vaccine. And I want to thank you all. Um, I will encourage all of our attendees today that the second session will happen on Monday, same time, 6.45, same place on your laptop or iPad. Um, if you have questions that come up, um, please, there is an email link in the um, press release that you can email questions over the weekend. We will monitor those. Um, and as well, you can always reach out to us. Thank you again, Dr. Stevenson, Dr. Talbot, and Dr. Calderwood. Thanks, Take care. everyone.